This is an AMD FX9590, the first 5GHz CPU. It's apparently pretty bad at gaming. It's also famous for being a nuclear reactor. Whatever it is, it has a very interesting story. So let's see how it performs. This CPU was released in 2013 with these specs on AMD's pile driver architecture, famously being much worse than its competitor, Intel Sandy Bridge. AMD might have also faked its core count, claiming that it has 8 cores. In reality, this CPU has 4 modules of 2 cores which share a floating point unit, meaning 2 cores don't perform as well as they should. So some programs detect the CPU as a quad core. But the CPU is most famous for its extremely high clock speed, hitting 5GHz turbo out of the box. And because of the inefficiency of the architecture with the high clock speed, the CPU pulls 220 watts. And its max temperature is 57 degrees Celsius, because... Why, AMD? So basically, cooling this thing is impossible, even with our Noctua NHD15S. One more thing, the CPU works only on the highest-end AM3 Plus boards with strong VRMs. We're using a Gigabyte 990FX UD5R5 with 8 CPU power phases and a beefy heatsink which we've added a fan to. Even so, the VRM struggles with heat dissipation under load, since the CPU simply pulls way too much power. These are the reasons why we and other YouTubers didn't overclock the chip beyond its max turbo, since it's impossible to keep below 57 degrees Celsius, you can't cool the VRM, and it turns into a nuke. All while, it performs pretty badly. For our tests, we overclocked the CPU to 5.0 GHz using 1.65 volts at low LLC. Other system specs were 2x8GB of DDR3-1866 RAM at auto timings, because the Northbridge memory controller is just not good enough for a higher frequency. We used 2000 MHz Northbridge and Uncore frequencies, put all games and everything on SSD storage, and used a GTX 1070 Ti to really expose the CPU weaknesses. Starting with the synthetic benchmarks, in Cinebench R15 Multicore, the CPU put out 765 points, which is pretty decent comparable with a contemporary Intel i7. However, when it comes to single core, its 118 points is really disappointing, losing to a stock i5, perhaps even an i3, when it's been overclocked to its limit. In Cinebench R20 multi-core, it put out 1,183 points, meaning AVX performance is pretty terrible. Usually, Cinebench R20 puts out a score about double of Cinebench R15, but since the AVX performance on this and other CPUs of the era, even Intel Sandy Bridge, is pretty bad, the score is very low. In Ida64's memory test, we achieved 25,000 megabytes per second read, which is not bad, but write performance is cut basically in half for some reason, much like certain Zen 2 CPUs. Latency is passable, again, comparable to a modern Ryzen 3600, for example. And let's test power consumption. We turned off the power saving features, and loading Windows, it can pull 12 amps on 12 volts, for 144 watts going into the VRM. In Prime95, it pulls 25 amps under load or 300 watts, and 18 amps when playing GTA 5 or 216 watts. Absolutely insane numbers, although given the wattage, the temperatures stayed pretty low, just below 60 degrees in Prime95 stress test. Finally, we get to what you've been waiting for, the gaming benchmarks. In GTA 5, the CPU could only manage 81 FPS average or so. You can see the GPU is simply relaxing, not even passing 50% usage. And a 5GHz overclocked i7-2700K could do just about 25% better. In CSGO, it managed 210 FPS, which is better than a contemporary i5, but still quite a bit worse than an overclocked i7. Still pretty respectable. In Far Cry 5, the pair gave 75 FPS average, which is perfectly playable, and it's the similar story with Shadow of the Tomb Raider, a game that scales well with CPU performance. 74 FPS was managed. 
In The Witcher 3, the average was 97 FPS, which might not even be a CPU bottleneck. The CPU also rendered Fortnite at 117 FPS with some stutter, but still you could take advantage of a high refresh rate monitor with this thing and even though there's still a 30% or so CPU bottleneck. For comparison's sake, we also tested with a 2GB RX 560 that we overclocked so we could use data for other CPUs we tested. In GTA 5, this CPU did 82 FPS average, while an i5 2500K at 4GHz did 96 FPS, and an i5 4460 at stock did 90 FPS, so this CPU is rather a bit slower. In CSGO, the 9590 could only put out 120 frames on average, while the i5-4460 did 140 and the 2500K did 160, so quite a bit slower here as well. After all of these benchmarks, there is a lot to conclude. Compared to Intel's offerings at the time, it could only really keep up with stock i5 performance and fell behind the i5-4460 from two generations later. But when an overclock is applied to the Intel CPUs, this thing really, really falls behind, even while it's overclocked to the limit. So this thing isn't completely useless at gaming when compared to Intel's i5s of the time, and its multi-core performance is actually pretty decent, meaning FX performance wasn't a complete and utter failure, it was more just disappointing and uncompetitive. What's more funny are the chip's other traits, like power consumption. To get this thing stable enough at 5GHz, we had to stuff in 1.65 volts at low LLC, which might not even be safe for long-term use, although these CPUs are famously very durable. So much for FX being easy overclockers, this thing eats so much voltage and power overall that going above 5GHz while keeping somehow the temperatures below 57 degrees is actually extremely difficult. What's more, the CPU doesn't have an integrated graphics, nor does it have a memory controller built in. The external memory controller in the north bridge eats a lot of power as well as the CPU, and it doesn't perform very well either. The only system on this kind of system would be okay at best in 2020. Obviously, it's not about the value, but the experience is simply not great. Single-core performance is just bad, and that makes using the system feel a little more sluggish than with a modern processor. Still, if you're holding on to one of these or a similar chip, it's definitely a cool piece of history, and you can have a lot of fun overclocking. About overclocking, this architecture was simply a beast at it, holding the world record for the highest frequency ever, at 8.7 GHz with liquid nitrogen. It's nice to know that overclocking DNA is an integral part of this CPU. That's all for today's video. If you liked it, please leave a like and please consider subscribing. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time. <music>